Hey, this is Leif Ganford. I played the cash register thief in The Amazing Spider-Man, and you're listening to the Everything Geek Podcast. Hey, this is Rich McDonald, and I play Commander David Mason on Call of Duty Black Ops 2. And you're listening to Everything Geek Podcast. Hello, I'm Simon Fisherbecker. You probably know me better as Dorian Moldavar from Doctor Who, or the Fat Friar from Harry Potter. And this is Everything Geek Podcast. Your attention, masters, mistresses. All systems functional for the Everything Geek Podcast. Hey, it's James Arnold Taylor, the voice of Obi-Wan Kenobi and Master Poe Cool in Star Wars The Clone Wars, and you're listening to Everything Geek, the podcast. Jackpot with the Everything Geek Podcast. Hello, everyone. You're listening to the Everything Geek Podcast. I'm your host, Rory, and joining me is co host Maureen. Hello. And also joining us today is a very special guest. We have special makeup effects creator Robert Kurtzman who worked as Freddy Krueger's head emerge effects supervisor and special makeup effects artist on The Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child, director, producer, writer, cinematographer, visual effects producer, and special makeup effects producer on The Rage, director, visual effects producer, special makeup effects producer, and special effects director on Buried Alive, co-producer, screenwriter, and makeup effects supervisor on From Dusk Till Dawn, Special Maker Effects Unit Crew on Evil Dead 2, Special Effects Supervisor on Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers, Feature Effects Crew on Predator, Special Maker Effects Supervisor on Screen, Makeup Artist on Leatherface, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, and Special Maker Effects on From Dusk Till Dawn 2, Texas Blow Money, and From T- Dusk Till Dawn 3, The Hangman's Daughter. So, how are you today, Robert? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? We are very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. I could have read even more credits out, of course, because you've worked on so much, but there's only so much time we really want to, you know. Uh, it was too long as you had it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I did go through them pretty quickly, actually, so, yeah. <laughs> but as I say, it really is a pleasure to have you join us on the podcast today. No, thanks for having me. You guys, uh, how's the weather over there? It's uh, it's okay. It could be it worse. Um, yeah, it's surprisingly sunny today for like the first time in forever. Like, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, it's a big surprise when that happens. Yeah. So getting right into my questions, rather, my first question for you is: How did you decide you wanted to become a special makeup effects creator? And can you tell us? about how you first became interested in prosthetic makeup. Um, well, it started, you know, I started out really young, being just a creative kid. I had a mom who was uh, an artist, so she always inspired our creative side. Uh, and um, I kind of uh, just started watching, uh, this is way before cable or any of that stuff, you know. Um, uh, it, it, is back in the UHF days. I don't even know if you guys know what that is over there, but uh, uh, UHF was like an antenna driven thing where you got like three channels and you had to like dial the box in, you know, perfectly to watch it. And, um, and uh, I, you know, 
I just was glued to fantasy films from and, and horror movies and, and and you know King Kong and Wizard of Oz and uh, all those films when I was a little kid, you know, and I just I was like just amazed by how they did things and kind of over the years once I started coming out with magazines and <clears throat> things about you know makeup artists making creating things and Ray Harryhausen and things like that I, 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 I was just kind of glued to that and started reading up on you know how they made these things and that there was actually a, a career you could go into you know so that that was kind of and I, you know I grew up on late night horror host shows uh, over here we were watching like Big Chuck and Little John, or or uh, Goulardi, or The Ghoul, and uh, and the, the locally everybody had everybody came up in the business at the same time had uh, these horror hosts that they grew up on in their area. So they were local horror hosts, most of them, you know, and they worked for like Channel Eight, you know, uh, what would be the equivalent of Fox Channel Eight, you know. Now it would, be, you know, it was. Uh, these guys just kind of filling airspace and they would get these public domain movies and show them late at night and we'd watch them and it was like you know it, it was like you know a giant claw it was all the b movies from the 50s and 60s or you know and, and and they would just play them over and over again every every weekend there was a new movie and we'd try to stay up it, it was always at 11 30 at night you know, stay up and try to watch it and, um, you know, wait for your dad to get home from work. You know, my dad was always on the late shift, so he'd come home at 12.15 at night and we were always in the basement or in, in the living room watching, you know, some sort of a giant monster movie, you know, so. Yeah, that's a very interesting story. Thank you so much for that. So, moving on to my second question, you, along with Greg Nicotero and Howard Berger, became known as the Gore Guys early on into your makeup effects work, and you started up your own company, k and EFX Group, in 1988. I know that you yourself were a fan of late, horror, late night horror host shows, you just said, when you were a kid, but did you ever expect when you started working in makeup effects that you would get to work on so many horror productions? and become an icon in the eyes of many horror fans? Uh, no, to be honest, um, you know, growing up watching these movies, it was never an, an attainable um, uh, craft. Or, you know, it was never anything that I thought was, it, it was like wanting to be an actor and, you know, and, and saying, yeah, I'd love to be Marlon Brando. You know, it was like that kind of thing. I, I, it was never something I thought, you could actually do being from Ohio. I'm I'm in the Midwest. I grew up in the Midwest. I live in the Midwest now. But before I went to Hollywood, you know, I was just this kid and I had no clue how to make that happen, you know? And, you know, I'm the, I'm the geek kid that's a fan club for Space 1999, you know what I mean? And, you know, going to conventions and, and kind of uh, like going, wow, like, these guys are making these shows and like how to, I had no clue how to break into the business. So, and, um, you know, I just did it. I mean, I just left when I was 19, moved to LA and started doing this. And I happened to get in to the business during the, the heyday era, you know, the big, you know, the eighties, the mid eighties when things were really kicking in and, and managed to come up in the business with a lot of talented artists and the, you know my partners and also uh, you know all the other artists I came up in the ranks with um, that you know we're all working at different studios at the time it was like everybody was at that time we were all freelancing we were just a bunch of nomad kids who were juggling around from shop to shop you know and weren't making a lot of money you know and you know most of the time it's there's like three or four of us staying in the house all sharing rent. It was kind of like, you know, um, the Manson family, not, not that, but you know what I mean? It was like a commune of like makeup artists, you know, or a, a cult of makeup artists. And, um, 
you know, we just, uh, all we wanted to do was work. And we were just amazed that we were actually working on movies and coming from where we came from because almost every makeup guy came from somewhere else. A lot of people didn't grow up in L.A. There's a few people I know, like Howard and stuff, grew up in L.A., but a lot of people were transplants. They came from other states, and we grew up, you know, looking at these guys, or, you know, watching our idols like Rick Baker, Dick Smith, um, you know, John Chambers, uh, you know, all these guys that were doing movies like Planet of the Apes and stuff when we were growing up, and we were kind of watching them, you know, just going, how do these this is actually a career we couldn't believe it you know and so that whole era was like i mean everybody thinks that era was like whoa everybody you guys must have been making bank and all this stuff we were a bunch of kids man just like you know it was almost equivalent to being a, a rock star where you got paid nothing and gave up all your rights to everything you ever did just because you were working you know just to work on something so that's very interesting. Thank you so much for that. So, moving on to my third question, can you talk about your work as Freddy Krueger's head emerge effect supervisor on A Night on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child? Considering A Nightmare on Elm Street was among your first makeup jobs, did you find any difficulties in pulling off the emerging effects? Well, it, it actually wasn't one of our first makeup jobs. We've been working, I mean, we've been doing a lot of stuff prior to that at that time uh, we were doing um we were doing a lot of sequels as, as KMB. we were doing a lot of uh sequels to the movies we we grew up on like texas chainsaw or you know uh nightmare on elm street or movie nightmare on elm street came out when i was in la what, what year did the first one come out it was 80 something 80 is it 85 83, 84, 84, 85, okay. So, uh, but I was really, I really loved that movie and thought Wes did something really cool, you know, and of course created a very I iconic character. But um, it, it, at that time, you know, we were working on all the different sequels to all the movies we grew up on, like, you know, working with John Carpenter or any of the directors that we were working on with during the eighties, uh, they were all people we grew up on. So it was like a big, you know, thrill to get to work with Toby Hooper, John Carpenter, you know, Greg and Howard getting to work with George Romero, you know? And so that was kind of the coolest thing about work. And Sam, you know, Sam Raimi had just done evil dead. And then we started working with him and it, it, it was just that era of like, Getting to work with, or, or Don Coscarelli, for instance, uh, who I, I did Baba Hotep and Don, uh, John Dies at the End just re recently. He, they're, um, they're all filmmakers that I went, you know, I went to see their movies at the theater prior to actually working with them. And I was like, wow, this is really cool getting to work with these guys. So, uh, did I answer the question? I don't know. Yeah, I think I think you answered the first part of it. Actually, um, uh, I, I'm not sure if you answered. The, did you find any difficulties in pulling off the emerging effects part of it? I'm not sure. Did you answer that? Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, you're talking about when Freddy transforms out of the girl. Yeah. Stretches out. Yeah, you know, uh, we did these sculptures. Um, Mark Maitre did the like the. Uh, what I call the really cool like twisty sculpture where the two faces are merged together and then um, What we did was the hard part was there was actually we were still doing stop-motion animation at that time uh, You know when the girl's leg bursts out there's all the stop-motion puppet versions of her So it was interacting with the stop-motion guys plus us doing the live-action stuff and then the mate whatever you know went on makeup wise with Freddie and his close-ups, and <clears throat> it was kind of merging three departments together, you know, at that time. Um, which I don't know if you guys know this, but on all the Freddie movies, there's like always five effects teams, you know, five different shops or something working wow. on it because it was such a short prep period that they break it into like segments for different effects houses to handle, and then and then during shooting. 
there was like four or five different stages being utilized at the same time. And Robert Englund would have to put the makeup on and then go from one stage to another, to another, to another, while, while different units were shooting. So it was very unusual. I mean, it's kind of common, commonplace now doing a movie with multiple units and stuff like that. But um, at that time, I had never done anything like that you know, where there was that many units shooting at the same time. So it was a very unusual, you know, uh, shooting process on that. But. Yeah, it's very interesting, definitely. And uh, you you both actually were a little bit confused for a moment. I did just look up myself. The first The Nightmare on Elm Street was actually released in 1984. So, yeah, you're actually right with that, Robert. <laughs> Yeah. yeah it, basically, that came out my first year in Hollywood, and I, you know, I knew Wes. I knew Wes's work prior to that because of Hills of Eyes and Last House on the Left. So, I, you know, I was that that guy, boot, you know, in my basement finding bootleg copies or you know uh, of movies because there was at, at that time VHS was just coming out. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I. I, I discovered a lot of the movies that I couldn't watch when I was a kid because my parents wouldn't let me or whatever, and or I was too young to get in the theater. Like I, I saw The Exorcist way later, you know, but was still blown away by it. And and it's the same thing with some of those movies, you know, a lot of Wes's movies like Hills uh, Hills Have Eyes. I didn't see in the theater. I wasn't allowed to go, so I had to I had to see it once it came out on VHS. And, you know, we were able to buy, you know, get a VHS player and go to a video store. Yeah, very interesting. So moving on to my fourth question, which is a bit of a long one. When you first started directing films such as The Demolitionist in 1995 and Wishmaster in 1997, CGI was just starting to be used in films, and you've directed other films since, like The Rage and Buried Alive, both of which were released in 2007 and Deadly Impact, released in 2010. Would you say you had to use CGI more in your recently directed films, and if you were to redo The Demolitionist and Wishmaster now, do you think you would have to use more CGI in them now, compared to when CGI was first starting to come into films when you originally did those two? Um, uh, yes and no. I mean, we uh, obviously when I did Wishmaster, and Demolitionist, there, there's no CGI. There's... Uh, it's all done green screen and film composite. Well, no, that's not true. Sorry. We did have silicone graphic compositing machines at that point. So we did do the compositing in silicone graphics. Uh, but uh, we did shoot everything as miniatures against green screen and, you know, did a, a painting for the background. It was a, you know, a, you know so it, it was not... At that point, not all CG was in attainment. I couldn't even attain it on that budget. You know what I mean? So in that in that sense. So, but on Wishmaster, we had a little more. Um, uh, and would I use more of it now? Uh, I do use use more of it now. And the only reason is is like schedules are so tight now. There's certain things you just make no sense to do. You know, you can't. You know, having a guy drop off on top of a building and risk his life is not worth doing when you can do it digitally. Um, you know, there's certain things that uh, safety element, safety things that come into play. Uh, doing 500 squibs on a guy in a room, uh, you can wire them and shoot that, uh, and take six hours to wire every actor and do all this stuff and do all this pyro or you can augment it with CGI. And that's unfortunately what it's come down to, but that's what it is. And I'm not, I don't really think it's bad in the sense that uh, it, it actually is a safety issue. I mean, like, uh, you know, in The Walking Dead, you know, they blow off tons of guys' heads, but if they were squibbing them all day long, first off, there's be, there'll be concussion issues, There's there's, issues that happen with the actors when you're putting those charges off on their heads. And I've had it happen on Wishmaster. So, um, you know, with uh, Andrew Devo blowing his head off, 
had to replace that whole thing with a CGI effect, which was actually a composite effect of a practical element. But the reason that happened was because on the set they blew the squib off and he got a concussion, and and had to go to the hospital and we lost hours of shooting and you know and and now looking at it I would just shoot it and digitally do it you know it makes more sense I'm not saying I'm a big fan of digital because God knows I'd love to see more practical creatures uh, I'm tired of seeing giant monsters smashing everything and you know golems and whatever orcs and whatever it's like yeah, okay I've seen it a million times it's not it's not impressive to me anymore like there's nothing they can't do so it, it doesn't make me excited anymore to see it so the movies that make me excited are these smaller pictures now that have um, you know these guys are creating things and doing things cinematically that make me go wow that's as minimalist but it was effective and it was cool and scary and it was a practical effect, and that's really cool. So, yeah, I definitely agree. I think that's a great perspective. I mean, so many smaller picture films really are very good with practical effects, but they don't get the attention they deserve a lot of the time, which is very unfortunate, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, it's really hard to get a movie out there in a mass audience kind of thing where you exactly, movie and it costs so much money. But that's what's great about, you know, uh, Netflix and uh, dig on demand and digital. And now to me, I, I'm seeing a lot more movies that I really dig. I mean, I just watched, uh, uh, we're, we're, we are still here. And, and I was like, wow, this is a nice, creepy little movie. You know, it's kind of cool. So, yeah, it's great. So moving on to my fifth question, now of all of the films you've had the chance to work on, both makeup and directing, which of the films would you rank as your favorites? And can you tell me what made those films so special compared to all of the others? Of my own movies, great. Uh, <laughs> uh, they're all kind of special. They're all, you know, bastard childs, but. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm very fond of Wishmaster. I'm also very fond of Deadly Impact because it was a departure. It was an action film for me, and I'm an action fan. So, um, and then there's something about the rage that I really like, even though it has its uh, limitations and its uh, imperfections. But uh, the making of that movie was very liberating because I was also shooting it and. Uh, you know, uh, it was just uh, a freedom of being able to do whatever we wanted to do, even though we probably bit off too much, too more than we could chew. Um, you know, as far as it was a movie that was just way too packed with effects, in my opinion. But uh, but it's a fun movie, and it's a the big thing about the movie is I really just wanted to be you know full of energy and just be a fun like kind of. Uh, you know, drive-in movie type of experience, and I think that it works that way. So I kind of love that one, too. I don't know. It's hard, so. Yeah. In some ways, it's almost like saying which, you know, of your children is your favorites, I guess. It's just... well, they, they, yeah, they all may have problems, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, but. Yeah, it's a really good answer. Uh, moving on to my next question. Recently, you and Robert England have been offering photo shoots of the fans at conventions with Robert in full Freddy Krueger makeup. So I believe you will be doing this for the first time in Europe at London Film and Comic Con soon. At what point do you think it is that fans of The Nightmare on Elm Street get such an experience? Well, look, if I was, if I was a kid, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm, you know. I'm old and jaded at this point. But anyway, if I was like, like a, a kid, that, first off, Freddy's like one of the, the greatest iconic horror. He's right up there with Frankenstein, you know, Family Opera, Hunchback of Notre Dame, you know, all those characters. So, and, and, and those are the old ones I grew up on. I'm even, you know, so he, um, 
to be able to take a picture with him and it's actually him is just like a really cool thing. I, I, I just, you know, when I was a kid coming up and wanting to go to a convention, you know, I was all excited about going to see, you know, the guys that I went to see at conventions. Like, and, I, you know, I was a big sci-fi geek, so I was going to see, you know, Martin Landau at a Space 1999 convention, you know. Or, you know, uh, uh, William Shatner to Star Trek convention or whatever. And, but if I had that opportunity at this, at, at this point to take a picture, it'd be awesome. You know, and I'm, I'm really excited about doing the makeup on Robert. First off, I love working with Robert. I've worked with him for years and, uh, you know, worked up with him on 976 Evil, which he directed and a bunch, you know, uh, other stuff. And I also, you know, got to work with him as a director. So he's really fun guy to be around. I like working with him. Uh, I like doing makeups on him because he's a great, he, he just knows what to do in the, make. you know, when you're working with him, you can say, hey, don't open your eyes for 10 minutes and stop talking, you know, whatever, because I'm gluing the makeup down and he understands it because he wants it to be cool. He wants it to be perfect, you know, so um, I just think it's a great opportunity for people to get out there and actually meet him. And, and Robert's a really great guy. You know, he, he just loves the fans and loves to, you know, interact. So, yeah, that's also such a great experience because it's not even very common. Like, as I said, it's the first time it's in Europe, apparently, that it's, this has been offered for fans, and I think in America itself, it's only been offered on a couple of occasions, maybe. No, maybe. we only did it once. I, only once, so very rare indeed, so yeah, definitely uh, definitely something a lot of horror fans should definitely get, that's for sure. We can both agree on that. Yeah, so moving on to my next question. For our listeners who aren't familiar with it, can you tell us about your current company, Robert Kurtzman's Creature Corps, and why our listeners should consider giving it a look? Uh, yeah, well, it's uh, it's Robert Kurtzman's Creature Corps, like Marine Corps, and uh, it's a core of people that work here, and we do uh, haunted attractions and haunted attraction effects, as well as all the movie stuff we do. Um, I have P13 Entertainment, which is my entertainment company, which uh, is the company I produce my mo movies through. Um, and uh, it's, if you go to check out our website, it's Robert Kurtzman's Creature. Oh, it's actually CreatureCore.net, C-O-R-P-S.net, CreatureCore.net. And um, uh, you know, we're just a, a bunch of artists that uh, can't do anything else. This is what we do, and we we just. You know, that's all we're doing is creating um, effects, everything. Right now, we're making fake cows for a movie, mechanical cows. So it's like, <laughs> I don't know, it's whatever, you know. Artistically, we make animals, bodies, human replicas, uh, creature effects, prosthetics, makeup effects. Um, we do a little of everything. So, And we know how to make movies, so we do, do that as well. So. That's really great, and um, we'll be sure to provide the link to the website Robert mentioned in our live chat. So, moving on to my last question, Robert. Do you have any upcoming makeup or directing jobs or any other projects you would like to talk about coming up? Um, I won't talk about the directing jobs because I'm pitching things, but uh, I feel like if I talk to them about it before they're actually real, that it's like, it, 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 it's a... Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a negative, <laughs> so it's uh, a hindrance. Anyway, but um, the, uh, on the, on the makeup effects side of things, we just started a film called Charnel House. We have a movie coming out called Fun House Massacre, which is actually kind of fun spoof on uh, on attractions with lots of gore in it. Um, we just did a movie with Dolph Lundgren called Shark Lake. Trailer's up online, but... Uh, we did the mechanical sharks in that, which was kind of um, uh, a bit of an undertaking. Um, and um, out, out right now, we have It Follows coming out, which we did. It's, it's hitting uh, DVD this month. Um, 
And then if you want to check out stuff that's currently uh, out there, we have Tusk, um, Late Phases, a really cool little werewolf movie. We just finished a movie with Kevin Smith called uh, Yoga Hosers, which is going to be coming out in the next six months or so. And uh, we're getting ready to start up another project with Kevin, actually, next few weeks. That's good. So we'll definitely be sure to keep an eye out for all of those films and projects then. So thank you very much, Robert, for answering all of my questions. I'll let my co-host Maureen ask hers now. Jumping straight into my questions, my first question is, what are some of the biggest challenges that accompany being a makeup artist, especially within horror? Um, well, as an effects company, it doesn't just land under horror. Um, we do everything from, I mean, we've done the Spy Kids movies. Um, we do comedies where we have comedy gags and a um, lot, of, lot of animal effect, effects movies, you know, where we do... Uh, animal replicas like Dancing with Wolves or S City Slickers or, you know, Wild America or, you know, you might just have a, a, a thing in a movie like we did this movie um, with, uh, uh, it was um, Road Trip and all we had to do is make fake snakes that, uh, you know, that were used in one scene where he's like feeding uh, um, m mice to a uh, snake. And then it jumps on his hand, and there's a big comedy scene with it. So, and there's all these little weird things like in movies that you don't even realize that they're, they're effects movies until later. And I mean, unless you know how to read it and break it down, um, and you go, okay, oh, oh, uh, Chris Farley is going to be running around with bats flying over his head. You know what I mean? It's like, so then you go, okay, now we got to make fake bats. Now, um, nowadays, it would probably be CG bats, but back then we had bats on wires, you know, flying around their heads. It really has changed. <laughs> yeah, well, and it has. You know, and to be honest, I can't blame them for changing it. Um, everybody's like so against CG, but to be honest, you know, if you do a puppet gag, you got to pay puppeteers. So that's now a SAG issue. So, um, and now they got residuals. They got there's things they have to pay that add, add up to more than having an animator sit in a room and do it. Um, so that's what it is. Yeah, I mean, it, it always kind of depends on the film more than anything about whether CGI is warranted or not. Like some films do opt to to keep with you know um, the classical kind of puppeteers and less computer generated effects. Which can be nice. No, it's great. And to be honest, I mean, uh, give or take a few of his films, but Guillermo del Toro is the, that perfect director. Yeah. That, uh, that mixes it. With the exception of, I mean, some people will probably see his new movie, which is the, the Haunted House movie. Um, there's things that are in there, but they, they're going to think they're CGI, even though there were practical elements composited using CGI. So it, it's... There's a difference. There, there, there's directors that use practical elements and mix it, and and then there's the directors that do all CGI. I don't know if you, you know, I don't want to rag on it, but um, I saw the new Poltergeist last week, and you know I'm a big fan of the original, so it was really hard to watch the new one, regardless, because you know I'm not a new person coming in to watch it, and I was. I was really disappointed because there was a lot of CGI that I was like, really, can we just show a coffin burst out of the ground with a real corpse in it? You know, it's like, with a real puppet corpse, you know? Can, you know, and it was frustrating for me because it was all just digital skeleton guys jumping out of the ground. My second question is, what kind of training, if any, did you get in visual effects and special effects? And did you receive any new training once CGI became more commonplace? Um, all right. Uh, makeup effects wise, I went to school. I took a course for 12 weeks. Uh, Joe Blasco's. I was an artist prior to this. You know, I had learned how to oil paint and design and sketch and all that stuff before going to LA and then learned. Um, it, it, this is also 1984, 83. Um, I 
learn how to do makeup effects, um, but real rudiment. It was real basic, pro, you know, school. Uh, they taught very little on the makeup effects side, um, but it got me out to LA, and then I broke into the business um, by you know hitting the pavement, going to you know. Uh, studios and, and and applying for jobs and finally getting a job at John Beekler's, uh, which was you know I started out working on all the uh, movies like Troll and stuff at uh, at the um, Empire Pictures studio, and so that was great because it was like coming up in the Roger Corman era, you know it, John, um, Charlie Band was kind of like Roger Corman where, you know, he was doing a lot of low budget movies, like three or four or five or six a year, and we got to work on them. And that was my learning experience, you know, coming up in the business. And I, and I came up in the business with a lot of other artists that went on to work with Rick Baker and, you know, Howard and Greg and everybody else. And, you know, Crognali was on The Walking Dead. And, I mean, Mitch Devane, who used to sculpt for Rick Baker all the time, it's, it's, it's just crazy stuff. Uh, as far as that, I learned how to do visual effects completely different. I uh, learned visual effects as a director, having to deal with visual effects. So then I became someone who knew how to put together the elements of visual effects. So now I could visual effects supervise. So. Um, I, I, I could see how to break down a visual effects shot by going, okay, we got a background plate, we got a foreground element, we got a mid-ground element, and this is how we're going to sh shoot it and composite it together. So that's how I became a visual effects. I don't do visual effects. I, I'm not a computer guy who sits in and does animation. I'm a visual effects supervisor, knowing in that in that sense, I know as a director how to put a visual effects shot together and make it work. And that's pretty much how I learned. That, that's really interesting. Um, even myself, I'm kind of leaning towards that kind of side of, in my own degree, kind of thinking visual effects supervision. That, that's really interesting. Um, so my third question for you is, because you've worked across so many different areas of film, cinematography, make effects, producing, writing, which is the area you find most interesting to work in? Uh, well, I'd be directing with makeup effects being second, but uh, I pretty much I'm an effects guy primarily because I direct so few films <laughs> compared to what I'd like to direct. And that, that's the process of being, you know, an independent filmmaker. It's like it takes forever to get your next project going. So uh, I have a lot of stuff I want to do as a director, but you know, in the meantime, I'm, I like to be creative. So I'm a makeup effects guy. I like, and, and doing makeup effects allows me to be on set, allows me to have input, allows me to, you know, be creative. And so that I'm happy doing that. And then when I direct, I direct. But, um, you know, primarily if I could direct all the time, I'd be directing all the time, but it's not way, Independent filmmaking, that's not the way it is. It's really, uh, you know, you have to go out and hustle and you're lucky, you know, you're basically pushing a movie every four or five years, so. Yeah, it's understandably quite a difficult kind of industry to work your way. Look, look at like filmmakers like Don Coscarelli or, you know, true independent filmmakers. Uh, you know, Don's last film was John Dies at Dan. It's been several years since. It, 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 literally his next film he has to raise the money for he has to put the script together he has to go out and do that and it's very frustrating but that's that's the deal and you know what it's a love this entire industry is a love hate relationship and I'd rather be doing this than anything else because I can be creative yeah yes yeah, totally understandable I mean it's the same reason I'm going into film myself is that I can't be involved in something that is in no way creative. I, I, I get where you're coming from on that. Um, so that's all of my questions. Thanks so much for answering all of them. Thanks for asking. All right. So that's all of our questions for you today, Robert. It's been a pleasure having you on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. You're very welcome. And hopefully we can talk to you again at some point. Oh, yeah, anytime. Let me know.
Great, great. So I'll talk to you again soon then. Bye, and thanks again for joining us. You guys have a good, great night. You too. Bye. Right. That was a good interview, wouldn't you agree? Oh, definitely. I mean, when I saw everything this guy had done, I was like, I have to talk to him because it's exactly the same area of films I'm looking at myself now. So it's like, oh, what's it like to really be a visual effects supervisor? And really so interesting. Make sure to check out our YouTube channel. The podcast is www.youtube.com slash users slash geekcast. Mine is www.youtube.com slash users slash Separatist Destroyers. Lawrence is www.youtube.com slash users slash Lizzie11. Check out our Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash everythinggeekpodcast. Check us out on Twitter, twitter.com slash everythinggeekp. Check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash official everythinggeekpodcast. Check out our Mixcloud profile, www.mixcloud.com slash everythinggeekpodcast. Email us at the below email, everythinggeekpodcast at gmail.com. Check out Robert Kurtzman's Creature Core, www.creaturecore.net. Check out our companion podcast, everythinggeekcomiccast, www.facebook.com slash everythinggeekcomiccast. And check out Channel 1 and Create Relief Broadcast Live from www.channel1andcreate.com. So geeks out, everyone.